I'm the secretary of uh, Litter Kinney Cathedral Quarter on a project that's six years old this week. And uh, this here has kind of been, the, the, I suppose the, the Historic Towns Initiative has been a product of uh, community working al alongside uh, the, the local authority and having a great relationship with uh, Joe and Colette and putting the project together. So it, it, it kind of stemmed the, the idea of a, a heritage led area in Letter Kinney was uh, from our own uh, heritage officer, Joe Gallagher, or Joe, sorry, J Jim Lynch, who was a town councillor 20 years ago in Letterkenny, proposed this idea of, of a heritage area. And uh, th this, is, this is the map of, from the Lord's, or sorry, the picture from the Lord's collection of Church Lane when uh, the cathedral was open. And Church Lane is called, so uh, uh, you can't see it, but there's the, the Church of Ireland, there's in the top right hand side here. And the Church of Ireland would be Letterkenny's oldest building, which dates back to 1636. And then, so we had a, the oldest building at the top right hand side, and then our most iconic building, the St. Julian's Cathedral, is at the top. So then it was, um, these, these cottages are no longer here, so the, but this, this one here is, was just built at, the, just at that time in the turn of the century, and that's still in existence, and a lot of the other things are still there if you go up. But the idea for uh, grew out of um, the, 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 I suppose, the White Atlantic Way uh, coming to Donegal. And the, the, when L Lonely Planet visited Letterkenny, we were described as a town without a soul. So it was kind of very hurtful to people from Letterkenny that, that, that we, we did have a soul. So we wanted to show that there. And uh, this is the street that it is. And most of these buildings here that they did back to around. Uh, some built in 1877 and then others were built at the turn of the century but they had been derelict through i suppose when with the the people from the town developing and the town center was started to become dilapidated it was the idea that we could do something about it so that, that that's how it stemmed that there and uh we had a lot of dereliction on this this side of the street and i i live on the right hand side of the street and it was my grandmother's house, so I had a great personal connection to this here. But I was the only person on that side of the street. And, but it's the idea of who were the people living in them, in these houses. And that, that, the genealogical aspect of the project is finding out their stories and finding out, out who the, these people were. And the evidence was still in the buildings, even though they were derelict. And then it, it was just about, let's kind of getting the, the find out who they were and telling their story and so uh, that's kind of finding out then who who were the, the people who were the property owners of the buildings <coughs> back in say in 2014 and then th this is dr can who owns number one church lane so we kind of established a relationship with the people who owned the properties and then when we were kind of moving forward and saying how, how you own this building, how can, how can we as a community group and then subsequently how can the community group and the local authority help you as a property owner get your building back into, into, into uh, steam and back into use. So again, um, a, a genealogical aspect was, was a very, very strong aspect of this here and I worked with Colm here from the, from the Heritage Council and Colm showed me how to use the evaluation maps and finding out who the people lived in the properties. And so again, you find out their stories, and one of the, I suppose it's very quite topical at the minute, is, is uh, the, the debate about the RIC officers. Mm -hmm. And I live in number three, and <coughs> one of the subsequent tenants who lived in number three was a, a man by Constable Howden, who lived there from 1916 to 1919. But then at the turn of the, the Troubles, or the, the, the turn of the War of Independence, he has a young family and he decides to emigrate to Canada. So it's, it's, I know there's a lot of debate going on about it, but it, it's just another aspect. And it's with telling those stories as well that we wanted to do uh, as a community group. But then, as a, besides, uh, as much as the project <laughs> is about the past, it's also very much about the future. And it's about how can we give these, these older historic buildings a new future? So we we have this is how this is how the the street looked before 
the Historic Towns Initiative scheme has kicked in. But uh, one of the ideas is that we, we've got a Facebook page and a, a Twitter feed as well, that uh, we decided that, that uh, if, if we buried those overhead wires, what, what would the, the, the Vista look like? And we, we work also with the, the LYIT and th th they, they have, um, that where I'm putting the green spot, they have developed the idea of an amphitheater in a, in a field just below the graveyard. They, they said that, uh, that you could put an amphitheater in this field. And so the, it's kind of ideas for the future as well that we've working on. And this is got, after this Historic Towns Initiative scheme finishes, working continuously on with the local authorities and as in how to develop the area. So and we are only a community group and it's a voluntary effort, you know, because of my own personal background, I'm un unemployed at the minute, but I'm hoping that this stems into a full time job. So how did we get the community involved? And it was was through uh, a series of small steps, just taking baby steps initially. So the first one would have started out with cleaning up of Greaves Field, where we got the local community and we got some of the local uh, businesses sponsored some uh, food and things like that there. And so we just had these steps of clean up a field and then it kind of gathered its own momentum. We had no money and we still have no money per se as an organisation, but it was just, let's start get, doing events that involve the local community. And then, so we've got a cultural program of events each year. <laughs> and the, the, our first event, Dolly, uh, is St. Bridges Cross making in the local hotel. So th that's our first event now at the turn of the year. And then we have uh, the Street Feast in June. And then we also celebrate uh, Heritage Week uh, every week. And we've all the Culture Night. And so for this year's Heritage Week, was one of the aspects of the, the Historic Towns Initiative. We invited all the former residents back to the area, the families, and they, they, we launched a little booklet which told about the history of the area. We, the one event that we did ourselves was uh, we have a literary festival every October. And the reason we have a literary festival is that because Jane Austen's niece is buried in the graveyard at, at the top in Conwell Parish graveyard. Not a lot of people know that. And because we've got one of the most famous uh, writers in the world, or a connection to one of the most famous writers in the world, we thought we may as well explore these connections. And so we started off running the small literary festival at the end of Octo October. And then our last social event of the year is we have a carol trail where we go from uh, the, the Trinity Presbyterian churches on the main street. And then we start there and we go, there's a little gospel hall in the center of the church lane as well, who don't sing Christmas carols, but we have a little short prayer. We go to the o former Methodist church on the Market Square and sing a couple of Christmas carols and then up to the cathedral and then up to uh, Conwell Parish Church and we stop on Mince Pie and Tea and then the, the street itself, we have got candle lights all on the windowsills. So it's this, this real effect of bringing people together for, for the festive period. And then another one of our, uh, a former colleague or on the committee, She's got her own travel, does a cathedral quarter walking tours, and then through the development fund, we <coughs> uh, set up an office on the church lane. So, well, I, was, I, I converted one of my bedrooms into an office space for myself to kind of carry out the work, and that's how to kind of coordinate it. But that, that sign now has been taken down on the, the Historic Towns Initiative. So, that that there. And then the, the other one was that we got a mosaic. Uh, on one of the, the newer walls at the time to give an imprint of, of this here. And uh, the, a design is, the, you can see it, that's the Church of Ireland, St. Jonas Cathedral, uh, Trinity Presbyterian Church and the Gospel Hall. And uh, uh, a local mosaic artist, he, he made that mosaic for us and then we, we, uh, we unveiled it on Culture Night. and. Uh, Whereas in the past it was, it was, I suppose, a priest or a local minister blessed it. We got each of the representatives to say a verse from the Bible where everybody felt <coughs> equality and esteem. And that, that was the kind of official opening. And then uh, one of the big 
aspects was it, I suppose from the start, from a community group point of view was that it was a series of small steps that 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 uh, that led into this year. So we 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 first participated in the Heritage Streets Alive uh, American Kerrigan's project. It was a cross border project where we worked with uh, the Fountain Street and and. Uh, Chamberlain Street in Derry, where we came together and we envisaged, envisaged what our respective streets could be in the year 2020. And it was the it was kind of people from the Fountain and Chamberlain Street worked on the Church Lane project, and then people from Church Lane worked on the projects in Derry. So it was a real cross-border, cross-community project. And then we, we, we were very lucky to get funding from uh, the Heritage Council to commission D Duncan Clarendon from the Aldous Architecture to do the conservation plan. And so that really set the seed for Joe uh, and Colette then to really get st stuck in to, to, to prepare to, to the council that the, a plan was there. And for our part in the, the cathedral quarter, while we, didn't, we couldn't call upon those resources, whenever there was funding became available from the Heritage Council or the uh, or the council in any aspect or whatever whatever pocket of fund, we decided then to uh, implement the 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 conservation plan in what way we could. So we would have had uh, um, uh, say uh, uh, workshops and uh, uh, traditional building skills workshops, and we would have worked with the property owners, getting little small scale work. Done to the buildings and getting the getting the the builder the the, the owners into the idea uh, of of um, you know of using traditional building skills and then uh, encouraging the owners then to to apply for their buildings under the historic uh, the structures at risk grant so a, a, one or two of the property or one of the property owners availed of that there before the historic towns initiative and we also worked with the the the, the heritage council. In the uh, uh, border towns health check, and then the the, the recent copy of that uh, the 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 border t or that, that's a copy that the the Heritage Council and Queen's University produced there recently, and, and about and the County Council about the way forward for Letterkenny as a town to go forward. I suppose thanks, and I'll just hand you over to Edna. Okay, so in terms of context, um, you can see here that um, uh, the purple line is the architectural conservation area. Um, our project was um, here um, towards the east of the conservation area. And as Donna pointed out, um, this area contains the most important buildings and oldest buildings in Leder County. And we've got the main street here and the new area of Leder County is developed over here. So we've had a lot, there was a lot of derelict properties here that was affecting um, the main street. So this is the seven properties um, which were the subject of our um, project. Um, uh, this was a project um, property here that Donna mentioned that was subject to Bolt Heritage Investment Scheme funding in 2017 and 2018. It was ready to collapse and basically we, the first year we strengthened the gable and tied the building together and the second year we re-riffed it. Um, so when we crossed the road uh, only one property was Loveton. Um, there was three properties here that were virtually ready to collapse um, and there was uh, this building here and this building here were derelict, vacant and in very poor condition. So um, there was an army of people <coughs> involved in our project and um, this is um, our sign and summary photograph. Um, uh, we worked with very closely with Donnan and because he knew all the property owners we very easily got numbers and got people on board and even a property owner who was living in Australia and which we contacted him via Skype. Um, we've we worked with five um, property owners and, um, you can, and um, we had a project team of an administrator, um, a conservation architect, um, Donan, um, which was a key person in terms of the community, and Joe and myself. So um, I'll just get to uh, touch base uh, quickly sorry, on two mechanisms, um, the two main mechanisms that helped us in terms of our project. 
So the first Donegal County Council set up a mechanism um, to help the, the homeowners um, in relation so that they didn't have to get out bridging loans and to facilitate this um, in relation to payments. The residents themselves set up a residence association and they set up their own bank account and got tax clearance. Um, and so that facilitated then the council then to award um, and stage payments then a grant to the residence association so they could then pay um, the contractor. Um, and the second mechanism um, that we um, set up was um, a legal agreement. Um, so once um, we tendered for a contractor, um, established the costing and the schedule of works, agreed with the property owners in terms of the private leverage, which was um, um, a wee bit more complicated in terms of a percentage because, because we had worked with the owner across the road, he had, under the Baltarian Investment Scheme, he had paid 50% in terms of his roof works, so we wanted to make that fair. And basically, um, we calculated our private leverage in terms of the, the cost of the, the roof. So each private resident um, paid 50% uh, towards the roof. Then everything else then um, was um, granted then under the, uh, under the Historic Towns Initiative. Um, so uh, basically, um, we got each of the owners then to sign up to the schedule of work. So there was no misunderstandings in terms of the works that are going to be carried out under the Historic Towns Initiative and to sign up in terms of the private leverage. And we expected that private leverage um, also to be given to us before works commenced, um, so that because there was a very, very tight budget. Um, so then um, we were lucky enough, we, we, all the owners wanted us to tender to certain builders. We were very lucky that we got a builder that came in um, on price. So everything fell into, into um, place very easily. Um, so then what this <coughs> essentially meant then was that um, so that the, the residents themselves where um, they had contract the contractor and um, it meant that was a step removed from the council because we were in fact going on to seven private properties. So it meant um, it was a step removed from the council. Um, so in terms of administration, I'd, I'll just quickly take you through this. So what happened, um, there was five, there'll be five stage payments um, all together. So what happened was that the works were certified by our conservation architect and the invoices were issued to the, the building contractors and to the owners. Um, Joe and myself then visited the site and verified that those, stage, uh, that those works had been carried out. The bills were then submitted by the Lower Church Lane Residents Association to Donegal County Council uh, and then we, uh, we then paid that money in the Residents Association bank account <coughs> and um, the residents then paid the contractor. So it's a bit of a, a pathway to payment but that's how we dealt with each stage payment. So we were very, very lucky that in the course of our works um, that there was public realm um, works being planned for the street as well, which gave us a great opportunity to, um, to cross directly work with our road section. So the residents, uh, Joe and myself, uh, we, we got uh, involved in the design and basically we wanted to make sure the public realm reflected the conservation works that we were trying to achieve in the street. Um, and also we were very mindful during the works that there was water work, uh, water, Irish water um, works on the street and it was causing a lot of disruption in the business. We were very mindful of that in terms of planning the works along the street. Um, just moving on to just a, a, another important point that we just wanted to quickly highlight to people uh, was that we um, negotiated with um, our road section. They are going to underground cables this year and we negotiated that when they do that, that, the, that, um, that there'll be, um, the electricity points will be put into each property individually, so the wires will not have to go back in the buildings because there, there was a plethora of different wires, ESB, um, Aircom, everyone, so we kind of negotiated at the very end of the project that those wires will not go back onto the buildings. Also in terms of ESB, there was um, a major issue in our project that we would just like to highlight to everyone here. Um, we had met, met with ESB and very early on before we appointed a contractor, we let them know that um, we were about to do the works on the street um, and they told us to contact them then closer to the time when we had the contractor. The contractor contacted them, everything was fine, but when they came out on the site at the very last minute, there was an overhead cable running up the street and they said that we couldn't put up with the scaffolding works because it was dangerous and that they couldn't wrap it. So I left our project up in the air and um, after uh, a week of heavy negotiation we um, negotiated that we closed down the street and replaced the whole wire so that the, so that the project could go ahead. 
Um, so it's just to let you know that there's even though when you plan things, it's not the very last minute that some major elements can um, can come ahead. I'll just hand you over to Joe. <laughs> right. uh, thanks. Thanks, Colette. Uh, the work then sort of commenced in early August. Um, there was a hiatus then in August because of the work that the ESB had to conduct. So they came out on the 1st of September, which is a Sunday. They, they did the works and the, the work, actual works on site began on the 2nd of September, although some of the scaffolding had been erected before that. Uh, again, in terms of verifying the works, Colette, Duncan McLaren, the conservation architect and myself went out and verified those works in the various stages to allow for payment. It generated a lot of interest once the scaffolding went up and works to, once the works began. People were curious to see what was going on. So again, through the peephole here in the scaffolding, you were able to see sort of what kind of works were, were ongoing there. Uh, and indeed, during culture night, the scaffolding served as a bit of a, an artist board as well for a project called I Am. And people sort of wrote up what their aspirations are. And uh, you might not be able to see it there, but we didn't put up that one saying, I'm glad, I'm so glad it's all over. Um, but it was, again, it, it, it stayed there then for the purposes of the, the, the scheme itself. This was what it looked like beforehand. These were the, these were the projects here, the, the six properties here and this four <coughs> property here on the right hand side on Church Lane that were the subject of the works. The scaffolding went up and very, work was, was able to be conducted on multiple buildings at once because of the scaffolding. Uh, and because were the, the buildings were side by side, so again the scaffolding then could move down a little bit further along Church Lane as the works progressed. And then even after the scaffolding, the substantial amount of works was done, some of the residents began to do internal works and still there was quite a lot of work to be done uh, there uh, to be completed, including a paint uh, uh, work as well on the, the buildings themselves. So there was slate roof repairs, and again these are some of the, the slates that were salvaged from the original properties and they were reinstated. There was uh, roof carpentry repairs. We repaired where possible, that was the principle, and um, replaced where necessary. Uh, in some instances as well, there was chimney repairs required, and actually two chimneys had to be reinstated, such was the, the extent of the works that was needed. Uh, lime pointing was undertaken on some of the properties, those that didn't have their lime overcoat returned, uh, but most of them did have their, their lime uh, render re-established. There was a lot of works as well to the rear elevation in terms of the roof, in terms of the windows and in terms of the doors because we wanted to secure the building envelope so that other works could take place inside. Sash windows made one of the greatest impacts along the streetscape. The repair of, of the sash windows here or the reinstatement in other instances. And we used the inspiration of these historic uh, uh, windows uh, on the, the buildings um, to design the new ones. Cast iron rainwater goods were also uh, included and uh, doors were repaired where possible and replaced in a traditional fashion. So these are now the, the residence doors along Church Lane for the, the seven properties. We've selected a colour palette and they'll be applied once the weather improves a little bit. It's looking lovely today. Hopefully the lime mortar will dry out and we'll get the opportunity to paint that in February and March. Uh, so again, just one or two before and after shots just to give you an idea of the the extent of the works and the impact that it's having on the streetscape. And then uh, the department and the Heritage Council officials uh, met with us on the lane in, in early November, just as we, the works were coming to an end. Uh, this is from number five, Church Lane. It's etched into the wall, remember, like a scene from Out of the Shining. Uh, but, <laughs> but we thought it would be an opportunity really to, to, to highlight sort of the lessons learned. So just to, to run through some of the points that were made already. The community-led approach based on best conservation practice, very important. It's at the heart of the Historic Towns Initiative, and I think that's really one of the strengths of the initiative itself. And the wonderful work that Donnan and the Letterkenny Cathedral Quarter Committee has done has really been uh, instrumental to the success of the scheme itself. There's also been opportunities for cross-directorate cooperation. Uh, Colette works in the Community Enterprise and Planning Directorate. I work in the Culture Division of the Housing, Corporate and Culture Directorate. We also liaise with colleagues in the, uh, the Roads and Housing Capital Directorate. So again, there's an opportunity there as well through the Historic Towns Initiative. <laughs> it's very important to have a clear and costed programme of conservation works. The, the condition of some of these properties were really, some of these buildings were, this was the last opportunity to save them along Church Lane. And there's still considerable works to be done to the interior uh, of these buildings, but the, the owners have committed to do those over the coming years. 
Uh, the need for strong conservation supervision, and we had a very strong team with our conservation architect, our conservation officer, and myself as heritage officer, supervising those works. Good and regular communication between the project partners is very important in terms of group meetings, individual meetings, telephone calls, emails, uh, visits to the street. The time frame is very short. Uh, we got notification on the 1st of March that we were successful. Everything had to be drawn by, down by the 11th of November. So again, we would maybe suggest that consideration be given to multi-annual budgets to extend that time frame uh, because it is very, very tight and it's very important that a lot of groundwork is done as soon as possible. But the scheme itself allows for um, economies of scale. Again, it became attractive to the builders because they were working on multiple buildings side by side. So once they erected the scaffolding, they could do work on two or three buildings at once. We wanted to minimise, as Colette highlighted through the, the, the mechanism that we established, that we didn't put too much of a financial burden on the property owners in terms of taking out bridging loans. So the council, if you like, through releasing the grant, meant that the, the, the owners didn't really need to take out bridging loans, which reduced their costs and made it more attractive to them. The one thing that we didn't allow for, and we were very fortunate that our, our budget was, was something of the order, we, we received 200,000 in terms of the Historic Towns Initiative, which was wonderful, and thank you for that. Uh, Donegal County Council put in 40,000, and the residents put in 35,000 in terms of private leverage funding. But it's very important that uh, retention of 10% needs to be, isn't paid out um, for a period of time until the works are practically complete, it drops down to 5% and only after a period of six months at the defects liability period does it drop down to 0%. So uh, again, in terms of good conservation practice, it's very important that that's allowed for in terms of the, the calculations of your grants and the calculation of your budget to, to, to ensure that your, your budget is robust enough to address that. Uh, again, in terms of endorsements for the scheme itself, the Kenny uh, Historic Towns Initiative has been shortlisted for the Irish Planning Institute Award uh, in the Participant and Engagement category, uh, and uh, I believe we're up against some organisation <coughs> called the Heritage Council uh, in that category. And uh, also, just another endorsement that we received is the, uh, this series of retro postcards that have been produced by a photographer in Letterkenny. Uh, tongue in cheek, it says that Kenny's world famous Church Lane, tenuously connected to all historic events, apparently. <laughs> uh, but we take that we take that as an endorsement, and thank you very much for listening. <laughs>